Cruising along Interstate 76 in Pennsylvania, headed toward the Atlantic Ocean. It is day eight of NV2AC. I don't know what I've seen more of on this trip. Semi-trucks, grain elevators, or those half of blown out tires that sit on the side of the road. Yeah. The trip is called NV to AC, so bringing you some poker action from the city where they film some of the movie Rounders in is something we are certainly going to do. By the way, I've always been a big American history guy, so being able to check out Valley Forge on the way into AC was a cool way to start this portion of the trip. And I've always been convinced that the fact that it's along Interstate 76 is not a coincidence. And my apologies for those of you in the UK that tend to hold a grudge that still aren't over it from 1776, but uh, Valley Forge is where I'm at right now. The poker room at the Borgata seems to be the East Coast version of the room at Commerce. Just when you think there couldn't possibly be any more tables, you can walk in the back and sure enough, you'll find several more. The first of two sessions at the Borgata on this vlog would be the shorter of the two, but it was the one that did have some interesting hands, including one in which I raised a 15 from plus one with pocket aces. MP1 calls as to the button and big blind. So with 55 in, the flop is jack, 732 spades, and the big blind checks. I bet 30 here. MP1 makes the call, and the big blind, an older woman, decides to check call me. So with 145 in, the turn is the six of hearts, and the big blind checks again. I bet 75, about half the pot, hoping to get action from one of these two players, and that is what happens as the guy on my left folds with the big blind check calling. With 285 in, the river is the seven of hearts, and now she checks a third time. I just didn't know how much I could get her to pay off with hands like King Jack. So I bet 125 here targeting hands in that range. She thinks for a minute before finally making the call. Creating a $535 pot, I show my hand, and she mucks. A little after that, I actually ended up turning quad deuces winning a small pot, and then went on to flop a set of tens. On that hand, the turn brought in front door diamonds, and the river was an abject disaster, bringing in a one-liner to two different straights, so I was forced to lay it down on the end. Then I'd pick up aces again and get two colors. I'd get the flop that you don't want with pocket aces. It came ace high, so I did end up getting one street of value before a fold took place on the turn. Said it before and I'll say it again. Flopping a set of aces almost always does nothing more than kill your action. Also, I didn't show the hand because my opponent folded and apparently I threw away $250 in bonus tax refund money that I could have had. So that was kind of tilting as that short session came to an end. All right, first session at Borgata in the books, a $701 win. Let's hope more of that to come. I was really hoping that the great Sopranos dream sequence, Tony's fever dream. I was always thinking it was shot here, but after Googling it, I learned that it was shot in Ashbury Park. So that's unfortunate. After the early morning walk on the boardwalk, I'd head back to the Borgata, which is about a five minute drive away. I check into my room, more on that coming up, and would end up getting into the poker room at about 3 p.m and there would already be quite a few games going on. All right, here at Borgata, once again, there are currently four tables of 2-5 going on right now, uh, and a long list here, as you can see. So hopefully I'll get in one shortly and start rolling. Also, there's two things that I did. 
at a casino today that I've never done in my entire long history of going to casinos. And I'll tell you about those coming up here later on in this vlog. By the way, I heard several people point out, and I didn't get to parks on this trip, which might have been a mistake, but I loved the fact that there's like this legendary Tuesday game apparently at parks. I had three people tell me about this. And apparently, I'm getting off on kind of a tangent here, but apparently there was this big whale that would constantly come and he always wanted to play on Tuesdays at parks. Well, I'm told he eventually ran out of money and stopped coming. But the game continued on Tuesdays without him. I didn't get to that game on this trip, but in case you're in the area, Tuesdays, parks, apparently is the place to be. I have a short wait to get into the 2-5, so I watched some of the show Barry on HBO. During this classic Dave and Buster's one-take shot in season four, I found myself thinking that I was surprised that Reno still didn't have one of those. And I'm only telling this story because it is 100% true, and I still think it's pretty amazing. 25 minutes later, after I was thinking about that, I get a push alert from back home indicating that one is coming to South Reno. I just find the odds of that exact news breaking minutes after I was actually thinking about it to be very slim. I'd get called for the game and walk to the cage. When I asked for $700 in green and three in red, I was told they could only do 500 green. And I'm not sure why the hell that would be. So I'd get into this eight-handed game and after losing three small pots, I'd get on the scoreboard by three betting ace king on the button and winning about 30 bucks in the process. I stayed card dead until I raised 25 over two limps from the hijack seven handed with jack nine of diamonds, getting four callers. So with 125 in, the board comes out nine, six, three, two diamonds, giving me a pair and a flush draw. Check to me and I bet 75 here. An older gentleman on my left calls in the cutoff with everyone else going out. So with 275 in, the turn is the four of diamonds. I figured it would be tough to get much money out of this guy. He seemed like the ideal type to try to bluff. So I just bet 110. And sure enough, he mucks the hand immediately saying that he had two pair, which I'm not sure was true or not, but I do know he's tough to get money out of with one. Then plus one makes it 25 and MP1 calls. I have ace, 10 of spades in the small blind and make the call as well. So with 75 in, the board comes out, king, four, deuce, two, spades, giving me the nut flush draw, and I check. Original Razor bets 35 here, folds back to me, and I go for the check raise semi-bluff to 125. And this guy goes deep into the tank. Unfortunately, my phone slides down on me, but I can tell you that he does indeed throw the hand away. All right, I did two things today that I've never done in my long history of going to casinos over the many years. Number one, I valet parked my car. Now, why would I do that? Some of you have probably already guessed here at Borgata. They have electric car charging stations, but only if you valet. I, I just think that's a terrible decision, but get into charge one way or the other. And the second thing that I've never done before is I actually pulled off the $20 trick. It was one of those things, I get here at 11 a.m., it says check-in time is at 4 p.m., and uh, I'm really just kind of exhausted trying to get into the room, want to get a, maybe sleep for half an hour and then come into the poker room. Well, they said, sorry, sir, you'll have to wait until 4 p.m. <laughs> I'd always heard this $20 trick thing could work in terms of getting room upgrades or whatever. In this case, I just needed to get in early. Uh, so they're telling me this, I pull out a 20, I put it on the counter. The second the bill hits the counter, she says, okay, we have a room available. <laughs> I didn't think that whole thing actually worked, but apparently it does in some instances. So file that away. I would lose a little bit of money set mining with pocket sevens, and then would open pocket eights to 20 under the gun, getting a couple of callers. Small Blind, who seemed to be the game's most aggressive player, would three bet to 140. 
This is right on the cutoff line for me as to the range that I'll call with here, so I decide to put in the chips. The player in the middle puts in all the rest of his chips, which was just under that amount, though, of $140. So with $445 in, we are heads up to a side pot. With the board coming out, jack, eight, six, two spades, giving me middle set. That was the good news. The bad news was that I would see him do something that is almost always applicable at 2-5. Again, don't factor this concept in if you're watching the final table of the 50k Poker Players Championship, but at these stakes, this is what I call a polarized check. It's a term that I coined on this vlog. A guy three bets big preflop and checks the flop. You will be amazed at the percentage of the time that they have top set or nothing. It is staggering. So obviously, regardless of which one of those two things it is, it makes sense for me to check back here with middle set. Turn comes the deuce of hearts, and now he bets out for 120. Operating under the previous assumption, I just call. And with 240 in the side pot, the river is another jack filling me up. That's a terrible card because it's bad for him to bluff at. And sure enough, he shuts it down, checking it over to me. Now, in the moment, I talked myself into the notion that he might have pocket nines or pocket tens here, and I should bet to get paid off by one of those. So I make it 150. What I should have done was to bet even smaller than that and try to induce a spaz play out of ace-king. He folds his hand quickly, much quicker than he would have if he had nines or tens. I take the pot down, but a smaller side pot than I would have liked. I then three bet pocket nines to 65 over that same player's button open. The flop brought three over cards, and the turn was a fourth. So when he bet out at it, I just gave it up. By the way, one thing I'm just kind of worried about at the Borgata, when they have tournaments, I'm just concerned that players won't know how much time is left in a given level. I'd like to get that on a few more TVs, if at all possible. Anyway, I lost a couple more small pots before raising king ten of spades, flopping an open-ended straight flush draw. I bet out and get raised by a pretty tight player. I opted to three bet the hand immediately, and he just mucked without much thought. That was the good news. The bad news was the next two hours were absolutely miserable. I never lost more than $65 in a single hand over the course of that time, but I lost enough tiny pots to result in about half of my winnings on the day disappearing after an unfortunate series of suited connectors and small pocket pairs that never got me anywhere. Still, I'd rack up and book my second win in as many sessions in Atlantic City. All right, cashing out, booking a $201 win. Yeah, barely covers room and this whole ballet parking deal. Hey, Kayla, how you doing? I'm well, how are you? Good, good. Hey, I just heard from Ben, and he mm. is somewhere, I believe, in Atlantic City. Oh, yes, I think you're right. And um, just kind of curious, have you ever been anywhere on the East Coast that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> I absolutely have, actually. A lot of my family is from Italy, and most of them stayed on the East Coast after they immigrated over. Um, and so every two years I've gone back east to you gather and have a fun Italian shindig. But one of my most favorite memories is after high school, I saved up a bunch of money and I went on a trip to New York City and Washington DC and Virginia. And so I had a grand old time. I was 19, fresh out of high school and getting to do like what was my first big girl trip. And so whenever I would think of back east it definitely holds that memory for myself of like stepping out in, in, into independence and my more adult self wow <laughs> well that that sounds the east coast is an awesome place and i know ben being in ac um mm -hmm. i'm sure he's having a good time as well absolutely gotta catch those beaches <laughs> Oh, 
on the way out of Atlantic City on the expressway, booking two wins in two sessions. So that part does not suck. Heading to Maryland Live, where we hope to shoot the next vlog on this series from this trip. You know, I think that if you watch this channel, you are accustomed to the idea of losing a lot of money in a day. Um, but chances are, you never stop going on tilt when you just get nickel and dimed in life. And that is the case with me. Now, when you go to San Francisco or other places in California, you know that you're going to get hit by bridge tolls. But years ago, they made the decision to only toll you on one direction. Obviously, the idea being, well, we're, let's just charge them double in one direction and not have to make them wait twice. And in California, at least they always know you're going to be paying, you know, five dollars, six dollars. It's always in even dollar increments. Well, here in Atlantic City, they don't do either one of those things. When you're driving into Atlantic City, you first get hit by a four dollar and fifty five cent toll. It's like, nah, we can't just stop at four fifty. We got to literally get one more nickel out of them. Then after that, you get hit with a $1.35 toll for some other purpose. And again, no, we can't just do $1. And yeah, we can't just do $1 and a quarter. No, how about $1.35? So if you go to Atlantic City, prepare to arrive and leave on tilt. And there were a lot of people who said, when I announced my decision to come here, they said, you're gonna hate it. It's a dump. You're not gonna wanna stick around. It's worse than you're gonna think. I just wanna to respond to all those people. and say that you're fucking right.